little trip must have shown you the truth. It would be better for everyone if you were just gone. Huh, I guess my speculation about this happening was uh, right to an extent. Yeah, good for me, good for me. Well, Fiona and Cake is over now, and that sucks because I really regret not making more videos out of the show while it lasted, even if it would have just been a couple. The Fiona and Cake's finale definitely ended in a way which I did not super expect, which was the only thing I was technically expecting because, quite frankly, I had zero clue what was going to specifically happened when I finished last week's episodes. Either way, I enjoyed what we got very much. From Fiona and Cake taking down the Scarab, Simon coming to terms with the underlying problems within he and Betty's relationship, and even the little content we got from the Lich was a non-stop combination of fun and stress. The first episode of the set, Casper and Nova, opens with what Fiona and Cake believe to be their original home filled with magic again. Even LSP is back to his lumpy self. However, once they reach the main city, they realize things aren't all that it seems. Gary and Marshall in particular are turning into deformed versions of their original magical selves, and so the two girls run back to Fiona's apartment out of fear where everything looks the same as it did before they arrived in Ooh. However, when Fiona opens her fridge, she's welcomed with a zombified version of Simon telling her he did all of this for her sake. She's terrified, but this is enough to shock her awake from what was actually a horrible dream, a dream that Cake also had. The real world they're in again looks totally normal like it did before with the exception of Cake still having stretchy powers. This worries Fiona because she thinks something may have happened to Simon for things to not be magical again, as the two go on the move, they run into Marshall and Gary on a little outing together. Fiona is beside herself happy with how these two got together, as I'm sure we all are, since she attempts to explain the whole situation about how their world is in Simon Petrikov's head, but they're skeptical to believe her at first. That is until Cake starts talking and stretching right in front of them. Meanwhile, Simon awakes inside Golbetty's dimension. He quickly grabs the nearby crown, but doesn't put it on quite yet due to hearing the Lich on a lowering platform trying to talk to Golbetty. Basically, the Lich was actually depressed at the end of the previous episode. He claims how, despite succeeding in killing all life in his universe, he's felt like he's lost all purpose to continue to move forward. So he's trying to ask Golbetty what to even do now while also questioning why it has to be like this. It's pretty crazy yet impressive how Simon was able to briefly sympathize with the Lich for a second there. This was a guy who was going through similar feelings at the start of the series, with Betty no longer by his side and feeling like a fish out of water as a 20th century man in the futuristic magical land of Ooh, he was totally lost as well. It wasn't until meeting Fiona and Cake that his mindset began to, you know, see a new outlook on life. The Lich continues to rant to Golbetty Betty, but she retaliates by turning the Lich into one of those green, you know, building block things that float around her. And rest in peace the Lich, I guess. At first, Simon is scared when he sees this, but attempts to reach his love inside Gold, apologizing to her about how he's failed to save her and how he wasn't able to live his life to the fullest with the other humans anew. But thanks to meeting Fiona and Cake, he feels like he has another chance to actually do some good, even if it means sacrificing his mind again. Simon motions to put the magic crown back on, but it's prevented when Gold Betty zaps him with some kind of spell. This is where we cut to the main world of Ooh that presumably takes takes place many, many years in the future. The one with Shermie and Beth that was shown in glimpses in the main Adventure Time finale come along with me. These two seem to be defacing some kind of royal or government building as a way to rebel against uh, a guy named Gibbon, who's actually uh, Charlie's son, uh, Charlie, Jake's daughter's son. I also find it interesting how the guards that are chasing them seem to be the same kind of, you know, dog ranicorn hybrid that Beth is. And I think there was some kind of Tumblr post from Steve Wolfhard that said she used to be the princess of the pup kingdom but was exiled for unknown reasons, uh, presumably by, you know, Charlie's son Gibbon. It's unfortunate that these two are, you know, most likely family and are on opposing sides of justice, though. Regardless, it's cool to see that idea from a Tumblr post somewhat expanded on here when it really wasn't given the chance and come along with me. After escaping the area and walking around for a bit, Shermie starts acting weird, and that's because Golbetty puts Simon's mind inside Shermie. Simon is scared and confused as to why Betty would put him in here of all places, but he's still determined to find a crown even in this world. Meanwhile, the Scarab finally wakes up inside the Gold Dimension, where he tries to slay Simon even with Golbetty right in front of him. Golbetty he sees this and zaps the scarab, which splits him apart into several little scarabs that are more bug-like than human-like. The scarab keeps trying to get inside Simon's head despite being zapped several times, and his persistence eventually prevails when one of them is able to get in, making it easier for the rest to follow shortly after. Back in Fiona world, the two girls continue to explain everything that's happened on their adventures to Marshall and Gary, which is enough to convince them about everything with Simon. But Gary and Marshall can't help but worry if their memories will potentially be wiped of everything that's happened in the normal world if everything turns magic again. The two of them really have a good thing going and don't want everything they've been through to mean nothing if that's how the magic transfer will work. Fiona gets really overwhelmed over this, though, because she doesn't want to be the one to decide all this. Luckily, Gary and Marshall suggest asking Simon directly to make sure some of the things from the normal world stay the same, leading to everyone looking for portals via ice-related containers. Problem is, when they do find one, it lets all the little scarab babies into the world, where for just about 
the rest of their point of view, they're trying to round up the little scarabs and trap them separately so they can't reform into the big one again. You know, shout out to Hunter for coming out of nowhere to help too. You know, wasn't sure we'd see this guy again, at least in, you know, such a relevant manner. As for Simon and Beth, they make their way to the local library in an attempt to find a book related to the Magic Crown. They do find one, but are forced out of there quickly after some origami soldiers try to attack them. You know, the book in question ends up being a half book, half game titled Casper and Nova, which sort of works as a sci-fi fantasy retelling of Simon and Betty's adventures together. The character of Casper representing Simon, while Nova represents Betty. Although Simon doesn't learn about the whereabouts of another crown, this story ends up helping him in other ways, like realizing how he never gave Betty enough freedom to do what she truly desired in life while they were still living in the 20th century. In the book game, Simon was constantly choosing Casper's path on the journey instead of Nova's, which led to an outcome where Casper could get the magic crown, but would have to choose between forgetting Nova existed or her straight up dying. This is sort of similar to what happened with Betty and Simon. He became the Ice King and forgot her, but then when he turned back to normal, she turned into Gold Betty, so she's just essentially gone. And this also factors in with the decision Simon made in the past, you know, how he and Betty went to go to the Enchiridion instead of, you know, him going with her to the Outback, potentially. And obviously, the Enchiridion thing is what ended up happening. And Betty doesn't, you know, really regret making the sacrifices for Simon, but there's gotta be, you know, give and take sometimes when it comes to these relationships. You know, Simon obviously loved her, but never put in the same kind of sacrifices for Betty's own desires the same way she did with Simon's desires. So he's able to come to the realization that not only should he have given up more for her, but if he had given up more to her in the past, then maybe things could have been different and they might have been able to live completely normal lives. However, that doesn't mean Simon should just throw away his current one or not be allowed to live normally again with his mind intact because of his, you know, missteps in the past. And as for the Fiona and Cake POV, the events of this episode more or less conclude with LSP who was sleeping under some laundry in Fiona's apartment the whole time, letting the little scarabs out of their cages, allowing the main scarab to be whole again and ready to strike. The final episode, titled Cheers, you know, how fitting for the show that loves to reference it. I, I wonder if these guys ever tried to get someone like Kelsey Grammer to guest star in Adventure Time, but weren't able to book him. I, I can't help but wonder that. The scarab tries to subdue Fiona and Cake, but since Cake still has his magic crystal from when he was split apart, she ends up freeing some of the prisoners he had in there. One of which was that electric fire guy named Cairo Siphon, who was shown getting beat in the scarab debut episode. Unfortunately, the scarab is too strong for all of them. Uh, the rest of the normal world gang tries to hold him down too, but that's also not enough. He's able to get his crystal back and starts destroying the Fiona and Cake universe from the inside, quite literally wiping parts of it off the map. Pretty cool how the statue of regular Betty got turned into Gold Betty too, it's a nice touch. Cake then decides to take matters into her own hands by stretching most of her body into a giant Godzilla lookalike. As for Simon, he continues to realize his wrongdoings with Betty while still inside Shermie, wishing he was more thoughtful so she didn't have to sacrifice her own desires over and over just because she loved Simon. This was a enough to put Simon's mind back into his main body, which makes me think Golbetty perhaps sent Simon there with the very intention of finding this book so he could grow and learn from his past actions through said book. Back to Cake fighting the Scarab, she's knocked back down to size after a powerful punch from him, so Marshall tries to stop him with a, a love song. I said tried, not succeeded. Fiona's at her wit's end too, wishing this world could just stay the same, which really felt like one of her biggest character moments in the whole series. One of Fiona and Cake's big messages to me felt like encouraging folks to appreciate the small things in life slash just make the best out of what you can, and not everything is always going to go your way. There's ups, downs, and of course, things that could, you know, be better. That's just life. You know, like living in a magic fantasy world, but learning to live in different ways can be just as fulfilling if you are open-minded enough. Something that Fiona struggled a lot with at the beginning and is now realizing how it really wasn't as bad as she made it out to be. The same thing goes for Simon. He felt like life without Betty wasn't really worth living despite the underlying problems in their relationship. Betty's almost overwhelming love for Simon to the point where she had almost no sense of free will anymore, and Simon not realizing how much she was giving up for him and not reciprocating much at all, you know, to even things out. But he's got another shot at living life like a normal human being, and he's got to make the most out of it, even if Betty can't be there with him. It's just like when folks lose a loved one or a spouse in real life. You know, those wounds may never truly heal for some, but you've got to do your best to make the most out of your own life. Not just for their sake, but especially for your own sake. It didn't mean for this to get so heavy, but that's just how it is with the show, huh? Simon formally apologizes to Gold Betty and lives out a scenario where he wished he would have just gone with her to the Outback instead of searching for the Enchiridion right away. And this other version of Betty tells Simon they obviously could have made better choices over the years, but she doesn't regret a thing. And I'm glad these two were able to have, you know, some sort of goodbye here. Back to reality, Simon gets a call from Fiona telling him the whole deal with the Scarab. He has thoughts of putting the crown 
on even after Fiona assures him she wants the world to stay normalified, eventually throwing the crown into the void of Golbetti's dimension. Soon after, he throws up some kind of magical dandelion that apparently has the power to turn Fiona's world back to normal while still keeping Simon sane. He reaches into his own head to give Fiona the world directly, and instead of using it to turn everything magical, she simply heals the already injured civilians, keeping the world essentially the same. And I take back what I said earlier, this is definitely a bigger character moment than when she just said she wished the world stayed the same screaming. And the way Simon was doing this, it made it sound like they could have had the best of both worlds, you know, where he keeps his sanity and they have magic, but she still chose to keep it normal, and I greatly respect that. So courtesy of Golbetty, she allows Simon to be free back to Ooh while Fiona World becomes an official registered universe. Scarab ain't too happy about that one, though. I love how this guy said he doesn't hold grudges as a professional at the start of the Casper Nova episode, then proceeds to hold a grudge even when his big boss informs him about Fiona and Cake World being legit now. He starts going on a destructive rampage, but thanks to Prisma breaking out of the prison cube, he's able to send some reinforcements over there from previous universes, specifically Jay, Little Destiny, The Squirrel, and Baby Finn with the Peppermint Tank. I know a lot of folks were concerned about Baby Finn's safety in particular from last week, so it's nice to see he's, he's all good now. Though I kind of wish the rest of the farm world Mertens family got to come along instead of just Jay and Little D. After some scrapping with the Scarab magic style, thanks to the Squirrel bringing some of these special strawberries, the gang is able to trap the Scarab inside one of his own eggs, thus saving Fiona world while Simon is back safe and sound and new. With the remainder of the episode showcasing a montage of Fiona living her best life in normal world with some magic sprinkled in because cake is still stretchy amongst a few other things, as Simon enjoying himself in Ooh as well, excitedly showing that Fiona and Cake fangirl some things while she draws a picture of Casper and Nova, fully ending with Prismo and the Scarab together in Prismo's cube, with the Scarab serving some community service hours as punishment for acting out. Though I do appreciate how Prismo is helping him find an outlet to express himself through a dark medieval fantasy story instead of forcing rules onto others through intimidation or violence. Finally, Simon gets some overdue therapy too, and with Minerva of all people. I love it. So, what's next for Fiona and Cake now? Well, it seems like they're living pretty happy lives, but anything could still happen. Especially since they do have some magic going on in their world now. There's a lot of speculation that there could be a second season because the first 10 episodes have typically been advertised as quote-unquote season one, implying there could be plans for more. I'm just curious where it could go from here, you know? If anything, I feel like things would end up taking a much more lax tone with the episodes because of all the major character growth that's happened with everyone. Like, Simon in particular seems like he's done having major involvement in future Adventure Time related things, but that doesn't mean he still can't pop up every now and then. Only time will tell. Let me know in the comments what you guys thought of this finale. Did it deliver in all the ways you'd hoped for, or were you expecting some more, perhaps? I would love to know your thoughts. Of course, if you did enjoy this video, be sure to leave a like down below and subscribe for more content like this in the future. But for now, I will see you guys next time. Peace out, take care, bye-bye.